Welcome back, everyone, to uh, Connect with a Loom. We are here with Sarah Garvey from Western Skies Handmade. Welcome to the Illum Studios. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So you're here from Arizona. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and you have your shop out there. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about that. It's a 40-foot shipping container that I redid the inside of, and it looks out on Sedona and the mountains up at Flagstaff. And then behind me, I've got Jerome, so it's old mining town. I've got lots of history, lots of wide open public land desert. So, so beautiful. Beautiful views. Yeah, it's a small town. Um, so I don't have to deal with lots of people. <laughs> so still feel like I'm in the country. So that sounds fantastic to it me. It is pretty nice, minus the 100 degrees yeah, in the summer. Yeah, that'll so. melt the bottom of your shoes for sure. <laughs> yeah. Comes with a price. I know you started in Wisconsin, so tell mm. us how you ended up in Arizona mm. with your leather company. Right. Um, so, yeah, I grew up in Wisconsin, uh, lived in the city. We would come west every summer uh, and visit. My mom's family was out here. So we'd spend the summer traveling in our van back before that was like a thing. Yeah. And so when I graduated high school, I really wanted to come west for college. I ended up getting a full ride playing flute. So I have my music degree super applicable yeah. in my current line of work. Um, but that landed me out here. I bounced around a bunch of jobs with park service, forest service, and eventually met a Texas cowboy. We lived on a bunch of ranches across Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. And living in the middle of nowhere, I found leather to fill my time. Uh, he started building saddles, I started making purses. Uh, we've since you know, gone our separate ways, but I've got the leather business now. We've moved to Arizona to be closer to my parents, and that's where we're at. So it's <laughs> been a roundabout way. So, so were you, did you come into leather to, to support your hobbies and what you guys were doing, or was it just something that... I have to keep my hands busy. Yeah. Like, I... I I have to keep my hands busy, so I used to draw, I used to quilt, I've crocheted and knit, I've, I've done all the hobbies. And so when we were out in the middle of nowhere, we had leather, we had some leather tools. I would play outside in the garden and hike and do all that, but when the weather wasn't great, I needed something to keep my hands busy. So I found, I found leather, my mom, traveled up to Oregon one summer and bought me a box of Pendleton wool scraps also. And so that's really where Western Skies started, was making these little Pendleton bags. Mm -hmm. And then I have like some little tiny shap leather bags that I would hand braid and hand piece together. Um, and eventually I got to selling those at a little, the little Gladstone Mercantile, which is just this little tiny building off in the middle of nowhere. Um, but the lady that owned it at the time, Thelma, she, she loved my thing. She would sell these little hand braided bags that took me two days to build, you know, for $50. And I just thought I had won the lottery. I had, you know, I was making little side change off my little bags and, and eventually I started making more and more. I got on Facebook, started selling them on Facebook, started selling more, started selling more. And eventually we branched into tooling the leather, mm -hmm. something I always wanted to try. And it started off kind of as a, almost like a competition between my ex-husband and I. We, you know, he was starting on saddles. I had been making purses for a while and we were both like, let's try tooling. Um, I got better at it. <laughs> and so eventually I was tooling his saddles as well. Um, and now we're here at purses something that I can actually relate to and understand, you know, more than mm -hmm. saddles and tack and gun holsters and, you know, all these other more common leather items. Yeah. I really enjoyed doing purses and finding that, you know, that balance between beauty and function. Yeah. Something that I didn't see quite as often as I wanted to within tooling, uh, like tooled leather, so. Absolutely. Yeah. More of the feminine side to things. Yes. Adding that woman's touch and like that thought process of like, hmm, how would I use this? Yeah. 
and then making it a lot easier and more functional for me to use and carry. You're on all of the platforms. Yes. <laughs> all of them. I know. I hate the internet and I hate the phone, but yes, I am on all the platforms. Yes. <laughs> and, and it looks like there's not really anything that isn't one of a kind. Everything seems a little different. Mm -hmm. And you, you live in beautiful Arizona with your gorgeous scenery. You're very creative with your music and, and you love to hike and be outside. Tell us about your uh, creative um, process, how you come up with something different every time every for time. every client. <laughs> I know. Well, I try to stick with, you know, the same uh, purse style, right? Oh. So I'll spend a lot of time designing each specific style of bag that I use. And so it'll be sometimes years will go into just thinking and trying and testing out ideas. Um, sometimes I just, inspiration hits and I get really lucky with the design. But, uh, so I put a lot of thought into that end of it. And then when it comes to coming up with all the carving designs, um, I just, I really have so much fun with it. I found that I enjoy the challenge of drawing things out differently every time. When I, when I first started, I used patterns. Uh, you know, I started with the old Stolman books, yeah. uh, just trying to wrap my head around what was going on. But then I started looking, you know, elsewhere at scroll work and, you know, it's like hugely rich history, like, way before American West was a thing. Yeah. And so I started really branching out there as well. And there were so many options for designs that it, to me, it was easy to just like, oh, I want to try this next. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to try this next. Like, ooh, if I do that, but I add this or I change the shape. So it's really like once you get that ball rolling, it gets a lot easier. Um, every once in a while, I just kind of get stuck. Like, I feel like I've, I've done it like yeah. all the, you know, I've, some designs just start to feel tired. And so at that point I'll go and I'll, I'll start fresh and I'll try to do something completely different. Um, so I'll come up with a new purse style. I might not end up using it, but it at least like gets my brain going. Yeah. Um, or I will try to challenge myself to um, to try something completely different within the design. So I, for a long time, I didn't like figure carving and I still don't like it very much. Um, I'm very, I, I love the scrolls, I love the flowers, I love the borders, but as far as like adding a horse or adding a person, oh my gosh. <laughs> but adding all of that was, something I just kind of shied away from. And so when I got to feeling stuck, I was like, all right, I like, I'm doing this. I'm just going to do it. It might be horrible. I could throw it out, but I'm doing it. And then it really just like, it inspired, like it inspires you to keep on yeah. trying things that you thought were scary at one time, but the more you've been doing it, the easier it gets, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And so really it's just been the snowball effect. And I hated with, with patterning, um, in the beginning it was really great. When I was learning to use my tools, right, using a pattern was fantastic because it allowed me to really focus on learning how to use my tools effectively and what tools I needed, what tools I had. But once I got familiar with all of that, I found that I just felt like a factory worker, just like, you know, same thing over hmm. and over and over. And I didn't feel creative anymore. And so I love that feeling of total creativity every time. And so I continue it to this day and I don't do patterns. My clients seem to value that as well. Um, every single thing is entirely one of a kind and it's designed just for them. And so my favorite part is really like drawing all those special details from clients, you know, things that are important to them, that mean something to them, and then the challenge of, you know, fitting it together like a puzzle and making it look pretty and then building it for them. It makes it more special. It makes me feel, you know, a lot more of like an artist than just, you know, a purse maker. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's funny you talk about that because everyone I've talked to talks about that getting stuck, that burnout point, and everyone has their own reason and their own way of getting out of that. So yours is challenging yourself and trying something new, yeah. scaring yourself yeah. out of boredom. Yes, or I'll do the opposite and I just won't go to the shop for a week and oh. I'll just go out and I'll go hiking or I'll go travel or I'll do something and just like come completely ignore my problems <laughs> so there is that balance but yeah, yeah. that's valid uh, <laughs> everyone should go for a hike yes <laughs> that's great so so what is your favorite project I'm sure that's a terrible question to it ask is a terrible question but it, but if you had to pick one what what would you say and why oh gosh um honestly I really I don't I don't have a favorite project I like I, I love certain things from all my different pieces that I've made. Um, and years ago, I used to create things mm, with the intent and like that underlying, I want to make this something that the client will like. I want to make it, you know, something that they will like. And I had this epiphany that you know, they seem to like what I do. And so maybe if I just make things I like, maybe they'll like it too. And so I started, I did this one collection where I only did purses that I would love to carry. Mm -hmm. And I have, have lots of personalities, right? And so I couldn't just pick one style, like I'm so indecisive. And so I made all these purses with all these different styles of things that I loved. And each bag was just it was my favorite bag. Like I could never have picked one or the other. Mm -hmm. And they all sold out, people love them. And so from that day forward, I've, I've always just made things that I love, like made things that I would have carried, made things that, you know, bring me joy and make me feel really great. And so really, it, it sounds kind of cliche, you know, but each project, we'll say each project that I finish, is my favorite project. Maybe not the ones that I'm, you know, like working on and struggling with and trying to like figure out, but most of the time it's the bags that I've worked on most recently are my new favorites because each one just gets progressively better. Mm -hmm. um, and if not better, I've at least learned something from it and I've improved in some way. And so it just, like it keeps, it keeps going. I don't have a favorite. <laughs> I could not possibly choose. <laughs> that is great. Continually falling in love with the process and the next project. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. So today's industry, um, leather is, is such a traditional legacy, but it's also we're bringing it into the next generation. Mm -hmm. And you're here, you're you're making it. You're a single mom, <laughs> just owning it, and you're <laughs> on all the platforms. So tell us a little bit about that and and how you've kind of broken into the industry. And do you have any tips for anyone coming into this 2024 world of ownership? That, there's a lot of questions there. I know. <laughs> okay. I try. <laughs> tell, tell us, tell okay. us about how you broke into the industry Breaking and if you have any tips industry, huh? for others. Um, like I, like I was saying, you know, I started off making these Pendleton bags. They were actually my clutches. Uh, I don't know if you remember them back in the day. They had a Pendleton body. They've got the nice little tooled clutch top. Right. Uh, there's been several companies that have, you know, knocked it off and kind of claimed it. Sure. That. Um, but that was what started it all. That was the original one 12, 14 years ago mm -hmm. or so, long, long ago. Um, and so I think that was before Pendleton got super popular. Right. And so I was making a product that was not available like anywhere, right? And so a lot of women recognized that and it was something that functioned, something that they could customize. Uh, they could pick the wool, they could pick the tooling. It fit all of their things. It looked Western and it wasn't, you know, imported, made in a factory, look like everything else. And so I think having that unique product from the start is what really set me apart. And then from there, it was just 
getting out there. I did craft shows. You know, I really put myself out. I traveled all over the place. I networked with people. I met others in the industry and just slowly, slowly built this business, right? I think a lot of people want immediate success. Like, oh, I'm going to start like a business and I'm going to make these things and I am going to sell all of them right away. Mm -hmm. And, and I put years, I put a decade into learning and selling and making before I ever went full time. I was really fortunate enough, you know, at the time to have, um, somebody that we could kind of share the financial load with. Mm -hmm. And then I eventually, you know, I took over, I was making all the money. I was earning everything supporting the kids, which I am to this day, but it's been a very slow and organic growth. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really helped with my success as well, just because I was able to adapt, you know, with that growth. And I was able to kind of control things and learn from things. And I didn't all of a sudden, you know, explode with customers and just you know, freak out, burn out. Um, I think that's really, really helped. Uh, and it's also something that I love doing. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love the freedom. Uh, I love the creativity. And so I've been very passionate about it. I've been very driven with it. Um, and that that's really, that's helped too. I think yeah. that's really important. If you don't love doing it, being a business owner, it's awesome single mom business owner yeah. with, you know, two kids, like it's not worth the headache if you don't love it. <laughs> like, it is, it's hard. It's yeah. so hard. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's really helped get me to where I am now. And the kids, you know, have supported me along the way. They still enjoy coming into the shop. Um, they have no interest in making purses <laughs> or <laughs> slicking my edges or doing any Come of the menial on. labor that I would really love to, you know, have unpaid workers for. Sure. But, sure. Um, no, but yeah, it's just, it's been, it's been a really nice, slow growth. And I am constantly looking for ways, not necessarily to make money. Like I'm not interested in making it big. I, I don't believe in, you know, selling out and, you know, getting factories to make cheaply made versions of my ideas. Like I could have made money in the past by doing that, but I really truly believe in one of a kind, like pieces based, like, like, like you said, you know, with that Western heritage in mind, quality over quantity, you know, meaningful pieces yeah. that can get passed on and that are well made and well thought out. And I think we need more of those in this world today. Yeah. And I've been so fortunate to have clients who also, you know, believe in those same things. Yeah. And so it's finding them has been part of that growth and really getting to them and building a relationship with them as well. So it's, you know, there's, there's a lot to it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I read this book once, I want to say 10 or 12 years ago, and they called it stick to itiveness. You de <laughs> <Yes>. definitely <laughs> have some stick to itiveness. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's really wonderful, especially in today's world where everything's kind of instant gratification. Yeah. Easy, fast. It's, yeah. You, you've yeah. really, you've, you've carved out a corner where you found people that value, you know, Quality slow. over quantity. Yeah, and just slowing down. Yeah. And I can't just, yeah, you can't just get something you want right away. And everything that goes into it, I mean, from the leather, you know, I love the stories of all of my suppliers, all of the tool makers that I buy tools mm -hmm. from, you know, so I've got Herman Oak. Yeah. They're wonderful people oh, absolutely. with a wonderful legacy that they continue. Um, my The tool makers, all of them I know personally. Mm -hmm. um, they're all really great people it's a one it's just it's such a great industry I know it's just this niche little thing yeah uh, but it's really fantastic that it's still so alive uh, and there are so many people coming in now too that are excited to keep it going uh, forward for generations so that's 
was pretty exciting to see also. That is, that is. Um, so my favorite question to ask on this show is, is there something that you know now that you wish you knew 5, 10, 15 years ago that you would, that you would share with others? Oh, something I know now. You know, I I can't think of I, I I feel like every lesson that I learned along the way was timed, you know, to be something I needed to learn at that point. And then I learned another lesson, and then I learned a le another lesson. And I think if I were to just go back and tell myself something, you know, that I know now, I I don't know that it would hit home quite as well mm -hmm. as, you know, those lessons that just like hit you yeah. or light bulb or, you know, I feel like it would have gone not unappreciated, but I wouldn't have fully understood it. It's like trying to teach your kids, you know, valuable life lessons and they're, you know, I roll, yeah, mom, like whatever. <laughs> you know, I feel like if I had gone back to my 20s and told myself things, I would have been like, yeah, okay, what, like, yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with this? So really, um, I think the most important thing though, if I were to go back, it wouldn't be to try to teach myself something. It would be to really just reinforce, like stick with it, trust yourself. Like it's not easy. Keep on pushing through and be true, you know, to you, mm -hmm. like just keep on being yourself. That's like the most that's the most important thing. I think too many people try to be like somebody else right. or they try to fit into a mold or they try to, you know, like, oh, leather, I have to be a saddle maker or I have to do this or I'm going to have to do this or this is the way this is done. And I think too many people lose themselves in trying to fit the, you know, stereotypical accepted boxes. Mm -hmm. And so I think just be yourself. Don't be afraid to be different. Um, and just keep on doing the best that you can at that time. It's the most important, so. That's a great, great insight. Don't fit into the box because yeah. somebody else is already there. Exactly, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, one of the biggest conversations out there today in leather work, and especially those that are kind of either newly coming in or those outside of leather work looking in is sustainability and ethics. And there's a lot of misinformation, and you've kind of talked about the products and the different things you use. So how, how do you kind of work through sustainability and ethical um, creations within leather, kind of fighting that misunderstanding? Because everyone that works with leather has had a client or had somebody talk to them about that. How do you, how do you right. work I, there? You know, I don't have that nearly as often. Uh, I really do focus on, you know, veg tan leather and mm -hmm. tooling. And so I don't get into a lots of others. Um, but really all of the, all the vegan leathers, yeah. right? They're plastic based. Uh, if you ask my kids, I tell them all the time, plastic is evil and it yeah. is going to be the downfall of all of us. And so I really believe in natural based products, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so even the clothes I wear are cotton, silk, linen, like natural based. I don't, I, I hate plastic clothing just as much as I hate fake fur and fake leather. <laughs> um, and to me, it's not just like, you know, a touch thing or a feel thing or a functional thing. It's really rooted in how it impacts us and our world. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to spend the extra money and take the extra time to be sustainable and to encourage people, you know, to be aware of the, like the sustainability of say like the veg tan, right? Yeah. It's a byproduct, you know, it, it could end up in the landfill and instead we're celebrating not just the life of that animal, but also that entire industry, like the, the ranching industry. I, I got to live on, you know, cattle ranches across the U S for a large part of my life. And I love that lifestyle. I love those values and the people that do it are hardworking, wonderful people. And I love being able, you know, to celebrate 
that as well, right? That, yeah. that wonderful heritage. So uh, I try to remind people, you know, if they're like talking about leather and how it's, you know, how do I say it? Uh, I try to remind them about how, how unique this product is compared to what you would buy, you know, in a store off the internet and why it's so important to slow down. You know, it's the whole slow fashion yeah. spiel that we get, we get to talk about more these days. So it's, it's a much more sustainable option. You're directly supporting families and American businesses on, on my bags, especially I, I really focus on only supplying things here in the States if possible. And if I do buy things from abroad, it's from something or some company that I can trust to also, you know, follow my ideals. And I think that's just really important to not just expect cheaper and faster, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's not going to get us anywhere. And so that's, that's been my focus. And luckily, like I said, I've found clients who also agree with that. And I found a whole leather industry <laughs> that, yeah. that also agrees with that. So absolutely. I love the really way, nice. Yeah. I love the way you said that celebrating sustainability. Yeah. And not to mention you're going to pay more right now, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be in the garbage in two years. It's not going to be in the trash. Exactly. I, I love the way yes. you said that. Absolutely. So what does, what does the, the future for you look like? Oh God. That's a mean question, that is isn't it? That is so mean. <laughs> that is so mean. Um, well, I hope I'm still carving. That That is still in my plan to be yeah. carving. Um, I don't want to be carving into my 90s, definitely. Yeah. But I still want to be creating for as long as I possibly can. So I do want to continue with custom work. Um, I do want to elevate that and find, you know, new people to share this craft with, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like it really, since the, since all the Western, uh, Western cowboy thing, you know, that's become very popular and mainstream these days. And right now it's really great that people are looking at Western things, right? And I want them to be able to see really like nice Western, like the best of what this, this culture has to offer, right? And I don't want them to, when they think, you know, cowboy western, to think of all the awful, cheaply made knockoffs, you know? And so I, I really want to focus on bringing this craft out to a more diverse group of people. And then I also, I love teaching. I, I, I always have, but having two young kids and being on my own and running the business, and doing everything else. Uh, we've been in the middle of home remodels now for over a year. <laughs> it's been so much that, you know, people have asked, are you going to teach? Do you teach? Can I take classes? And it, I'm, I've been so overwhelmed with everything else that I haven't had the opportunity to really be able to focus on that. And so now that my kids are slightly older, um, they're right around middle school age, yeah. just terrifying but also um it it frees up a little bit of time for me and so eventually I want to focus more on teaching too mm -hmm. and really just keeping that bar high you know for this craft because you can reach great high, like you can create beautiful things if you know that that is a possibility and so I really want to pass on that the love for the craft but also uh, show what's possible, uh, and hopefully people will take it even further, you know, Absolutely. and create even more beauty. So that that's kind of what I have in my future. <laughs> Very vague. <laughs> no, that's great. We just roll with it. That's so. great. Speaking of teaching, we snagged you in all of your free time yes. to come up here to the Illum Studios. Yes. So what are you doing here? What have you been teaching this week? You've been here Ooh. since since Monday up yes. here in Salt Lake City. So, so what have you been doing here? Oh gosh. Okay. So first we got to play with the beautiful flowers and we made some bouquet wraps. Uh, that's something that I've, I make a little bit differently than what you 
you know, might imagine as a leather crafter. And I really wanted to share with the community, you know, why it is I make things like this and kind of explain some of the um, the things to think about, you know, whenever you are making something new that you've never made. So we made bouquet wraps and we talked about uh, bouquets and we talked about different ideas and th things to think about basically to make a nicely fitting bouquet. Um, so that was fun. That was short and sweet. Uh, the bulk of the, <laughs> the bulk of everything went into pattern drafting. Okay. Um, which was a big thing to chew off. Uh, we did. We drafted five patterns uh, from conception all the way to you know a rough prototype in leather. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of information in there, but. I feel like in this day and age, you know, not as many people are familiar with patterning or sewing. I grew up sewing my own clothes. So I was super familiar with patterns. Like I understood how things went together. I could picture it in my head, you know, how to take a three-dimensional object and flatten it onto a piece of paper. Yeah. Uh, but apparently <laughs> not everybody has that background <laughs> and can understand it. I wouldn't know and, where to start. <laughs> and it seems... It seems very, you know, simple and straightforward to me, but I see too many, you know, too many leather workers are like, oh, do you have a pattern for that? And I'm like, it's a journal cover. Like, you just need the, the book dimensions, right? But what's obvious to me sometimes is not to everybody, and I get it. Like, it can be scary, and so I wanted to do a course where I just tried to simplify it as much as possible and make it understandable. We did very, very basic patterns, you know, very basic shapes. And then from there, I mean, the sky's the limit on it. You just adjust things here and there and you have completely new creations. So with veg tan leather, there aren't very many resources for how to make bags. It's all, mm -hmm. you know, soft fabrics and soft leathers that you can do different things with. Veg tan is uh, a little more unforgiving. Yeah. <laughs> a little more difficult to deal with sometimes. And then yesterday we finished up with a course on adding color mm -hmm. to your designs. Um, I love adding color mm -hmm. on my leather work. You were talking color theory, weren't you? Yes, yeah, so I feel like a lot of leather workers probably missed out on art class. I know I did, I was, I was so busy with music that you, know, you had to choose an elective in school all through growing up and I always picked music and so I missed out on the art classes and so when I got to doing leather you know things kind of naturally made sense to me my my great aunt was an art professor and so I grew up you know being surrounded by creative people and being surrounded by art and I've always doodled my whole life but I've never had that clear instruction breaking it down you know and having things explained in a way that made sense. And so when I started adding color, you know, it was a, a learning curve, like a big learning curve, trying to figure out what things worked, what things didn't, what paints do I use? You know, how should I finish them? Like, oh, there's, there are a lot of questions. Uh, and then I started on my own going into, you know, studying art theory, art fundamentals, uh, like, you know, at, as it applies to layout design, as it apply, applies to very general concepts, um, and a lot, and some more specific ones. You know, I I, I watch YouTube videos nonstop on these things. Mm -hmm. I nerded out on art theory, and I got really into um, color theory, and color mixing, and where pigments come from, and all oh, this is so fascinating and it started to make more sense like the more I studied it the more I heard like the same things being said over and over and I'm like oh like these painters have it figured out <laughs> like why did I not just like do this from the get-go and so I didn't see that explained in the leather world so much right because a lot of us are you know maybe start out as hobbyists and have no formal training and there's no school that you can go to no. to earn a degree in leather work like that I know of right <laughs> just, it's just not learn with a loom except here right yes, learn with a loom <laughs> yes <laughs> 
Yeah, so uh, I wanted to be able to add that because maybe it's not going to make sense to everybody and maybe it's just going to confuse some people. But if it helps a handful of people to just have that light bulb moment, like, oh, like, oh, this is like, this is the, this is makes sense to me. Uh, I really want to pass that on too, because there are some key points that once you have those down, you know, you can go from there and create things that, that really work with the leather. And so we did a course on color. I nerded out on color. We got to play around mixing some colors and we didn't cover everything because I could spend, you know, months talking, yeah. talking about things and playing with things and, you know, experimenting with things, but it's just to get you interested, get to get you thinking and, you know, make you want to explore all of these concepts a lot more on your own and grow from there. So that's yeah. great. Okay. Now, where are you going? Where are you going to be at any shows or any work that people can can find you coming this summer? Um, this summer, no, no. Later oh, this year, I will be in my studio working all baking. summer while it's hot outside. I have the air conditioning on, and I do not go out except to go swim in the river. Um, but no, I really, I've, I've kind of slow down on doing a lot of shows more recently. I'm always at the Prescott Leather Show. It's right just there. over the mountain from me. So I will be, uh, I think the plan is I will be teaching classes there next year as well. And once the kids get just a little bit older, I will be branching into doing more classes in the future. Um, but as far as 2024 goes, I'm still gonna be pretty quiet. Still on social media. Great. Uh, still posting content there. And your handles are Western Skies Handmade. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yep. Long oh. but simple. Yeah. All the same. <laughs> yeah. yep. Well, I really appreciate your time talking to me and, and everyone else that's joining yeah. us on the show. It's a lot of fun getting to know you and talking leather. Yes. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And stay tuned for, for Sarah on the Learn with the Loom platform and more conversations <laughs> coming to this channel. A Loom Connect is the place to connect with the world of leathercraft. A Loom Magazine, Learn with a Loom, and a Loom Events, all of these outlets are a place to learn more and get involved in the leather crafting community. We hope to see you soon in print, online, or at one of our events.